So my name is uh, John Perkis and I'm a senior advisor with uh, Natural Step uh, Canada and have been working on sustainability uh, in the, uh, the building sector, uh, with, in particular with municipalities uh, for, for the last 10, um, 10 to 12 years. And today you'll be hearing a little bit from me about uh, sustainability, uh, built environment, um, and some neat examples, emerging examples that are, are, are coming from the sector. Um, also, uh, my uh, friend and colleague Dina Sperling will be speaking today. She's the education manager from the Toronto chapter of the Canada Green Building Council. Um, so what, this is what we would like to uh, cover. We've got a couple of polls that we'll be doing and uh, some questions and answer. Um, we're going to go, I just want to share some of the survey results that we did for the webinar, which helped us f sort of fine tune and focus our, our, uh, our slides and their stories. Uh, we'll provide a little bit of a history of LEED and sustainability and get into some of the, the cutting edge um, stuff after that by sharing a few examples. And that, that also includes uh, cutting edge within the building sector from the built environment perspective. Um, also it includes, well, what, what are some of the transformations that are happening within the sector? So not only about green buildings, but actually greening the building sector as well. So we have a few, a few examples there as well. Um, so the nat Natural Step, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Natural Step as an organization. If you're not, and uh, some of you were not as familiar from the survey results, and I'll, I'm just going to provide a very short overview. There's more content uh, on our website, of course. So we're uh, part of an international uh, not group of nonprofit organizations who've been working uh, at the forefront of sustainability for the past 20 years and um, have used this thing called uh, the Framework for St Strategic Sustainable Development or Natural Step Framework and have helped organizations bring in this new way of, of looking at things, this new way of um, perceiving and uh, imagining their organizations. Uh, we brought that into their companies to help them uh, do what they do best. For example, interface carpeting is awesome at making carpets. Um, and they became even more awesome at making carpets that were biodegradable and sustainable and, and all that. So we help organizations go through that transformation um, and uh, communities and nonprofits as well. So there's a few different um, groups on, on the screen from a municipal perspective that we've uh, worked with. And again, my, my focus has been a little bit more with, on the municipal uh, side and uh, also some of our, our business partners. And uh, today here I'll be talking about, in particular, uh, Landmark Group of Builders. And there's another one um, called, they're called Sarah Architects, uh, based in uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, on the west coast of the states that, that we've worked with in the building sector. But as you can see, there's quite a wide diversity of organizations that, um, uh, that, uh, that, that we've had the pleasure of working with, and also that relate to buildings, you can imagine you know, McDonald's has tons of buildings. Um, the work we've done here is more in Sweden, um, but there's there's some neat and interesting examples uh, within each of these uh, the, each of these sectors. Um, so I'm going to pass it over now to uh, to Dana to introduce herself a little bit more, and then we'll we'll dive into the presentation for today. Hi, so welcome everyone. It's Donna Sperling. I'm from the Canada Green Building Council, the Greater Toronto Chapter. Um, and so just giving you kind of an overview, we are a national organization and we have a collective mission which is basically just to lead, accelerate, promote the transformation of our market to high performing healthy green buildings, homes, communities and such throughout Canada. Slow to come so sorry, I'm just passing. <laughs> Dan and I are both in different cities. I'm in Ottawa today and she's in Toronto, so we're just uh, passing each other the controls for the system. Perfect. Good. Yep. So as I said, we are national and we are, or I should say, I'm only representing the uh, Greater Toronto Chapter, but we do have eight chapters across the country. We are the largest one in Toronto. We have about 700 green building professionals as part of our membership and we have about 6,000 subscribers. So we have quite a following. I'm not sure if... Uh, okay, I'll, I'll move the slides forward. Okay, perfect, thanks. Um, so yeah, just to give you a little bit of, uh, you know, 
briefing in terms of what we do, um, we're well known for our work with the LEAD rating system. And so um, this rating system is basically meant to encourage leadership in energy and environmental de design. So we work with a lot of green professionals, and we work with them to get them accredited on various different um, schemes or, or trends within the system. Great. So we'll hear, uh, we'll hear a little bit more. What I'm going to do now is just uh, highlight some of the survey results. So we have, um, we've got about 36 people on the uh, call at this time. And uh, we had 24 uh, people respond to the pre-webinar survey. So this is, gives us an example of who's on who's on the call, the type of um, you know, the type of experience that you've had. And there's a number of people, over half, who are uh, new or newer to this area. Um, diversity in sectors, so in particular, green emerging green builders, uh, policy uh, policy makers, uh, architects, and and sustainability managers. And we didn't really have anyone from uh, builders or developers um, or uh, specific trades uh, trades people on the call today. In terms of knowledge, this is how participants rated their knowledge uh, from from the, the webinar. So there's quite a diversity from you know it, it's really a, it, leaning towards average to towards good uh, knowledge, which is great. And then we did ask based on the agenda, what do people want to spend, us to spend our time on so that it's more valuable for you? So. You might see me skipping through a few slides here. I've, uh, I'm not going to get into this as much, and we're going to focus a little bit more on a little bit on the current reality, but more on what's what's going what's going on. What are some of the emerging trends that uh, that we're seeing? So I'm going to pass it uh, back over to you, Dana, for uh, for the next uh, set of slides. Perfect. So I mean, a lot of you, I'm sure. Uh, being involved within this industry, um, know a little bit about this, but we wanted to answer the question, why green buildings? Um, there's obviously a, a lot of information circulating around uh, the impacts of kind of traditional building systems, so the non-green buildings, and we just wanted to highlight some of those. So within our industry, um, there are implications of not greening our ventures or not being the most energy efficient, and some of those include um, 3 billion tons of raw materials, or approximately 40% of our global use um, for these materials and energy systems. Um, we also have 35% um, of Canada's greenhouse gases emissions that we're consuming, 33% um, of Canada's energy consumption, 50% of the natural resource, 12% non-industrial water use, and 25% of waste going to landfills. So quite a number of negative implications if we're not going the green route. Do you want to go to the next slide? <laughs> okay. There we go. Perfect. So then, you know, coming back to LEAD and what we represent as an organization, um, LEAD is consensus-based. It's based on best practices. Um, it's based on um, input from our memberships. It's also voluntary. So it recognizes that some people might take this on, and uh, they're not mandated to do it. So it recognizes leadership for those that do um, do end up taking up these practices. And it's also international, so it's not exclusive to one region or another, but it is recognized around the world. Um, and it's also full scope. So it's, you know, right from the get-go, we work on a, an integrative process looking at the design, construction, and operation aspects of, um, of the building industry. It's also uh, founded in 1993, and it came to Canada in 2001. So some of the details around LEED. Going into a little bit more detail in terms of the rating systems, um, there are a number of different streams or a number of different uh, systems that work based on the, the building construction or um, existing build. So we have homes, which is very different from the the rest of them. We have ones that are looking at the neighborhood level, so neighborhood development. We also look in terms of um, commercial interiors. So if we're uh, looking at a specific square footage within an existing building, it might qualify for a commercial interior uh, system. Or if it's a uh, larger scale, it would qualify for the core and shell 
rating systems. And then, of course, we have our new construction, so you know, ground up or major renovations. And then there's also the existing buildings. So if people are retrofitting their buildings or they just want to day-to-day -day have operations and maintenance that are in line with uh, energy efficiency, they can qualify for that as well. And as you'll see, there are a number of other ones that we do not have in Canada at present. They're only in the States. And uh, within time, we hope that they will come to Canada. But uh, if people are looking for those uh, designations, then they would have to go through our counterpart in the US, which is the US GBC. So what does LEED actually measure? Um, there are various categories, and there are credits that are appointed for each of those categories. It's based on a 100-point scale. And like I said, each uh, category has those credits or prerequisites that must be achieved within them. Um, and then there's a minimum number of points based um, on that to be certified. And that would depend on, on the level of certification that you would want to achieve. So if we go to the next slide. So these are our uh, levels of certification. So you can be certified. You can achieve a silver level, gold, or platinum. And if you go to the next slide, this just shows that the percentage of Ontario LEED certified pr uh, projects and where they fall within these different levels. So just interesting facts that the majority um, are going for gold, which is quite a phenomenal achievement. But there are ones that fall into the other categories as well. And we just wanted to highlight the fact, I mean, it seems pretty apparent, but um, green building does pr produce these real results. Um, it's interesting to see that the industry is mature enough to know that we know how to build green. We're just getting better at getting that message out to all of the various professionals, so the designers, contractors, tradespeople, operators, and owners. Um, it's, these practices are becoming more widespread, and that we believe that the, the more advocates that we have out there, the faster we'll be able to change those construction practices across the board. And then, obviously, um, the result will be the um, reduction of greenhouse gases and you know, positive changes for our, for our climate. Um, so we just thought we would showcase some of those percentages as compared to conventional builds. And again, just to highlight this, um, construction overall is changing. One thing is clear is that construction is only moving in one direction. It's towards those greener, higher performing buildings. And for some of this, it's because of the financial uh, benefits that come from that. So it's showing that over the long term, there are some energy savings. So that's wonderful. Um, you see that. Um, especially those, if you go back to the slide, sorry, you see especially with institutions and owners that have a large portfolio, they're requesting these greener buildings because they're better built, they're more durable, and they are using less energy. Um, you can see from this graph, too, um, especially way, way back in 2005, it on, this green building sector only comprised a tiny fraction of the non-residential construction market. And then only seven years later, you see that it makes up about 44% of the market. So quite a drastic change. Um, and then even though the US construction market fell uh, off a cliff in 2008, there was a little bit of a, a depression period, um, the trend continues to rise with the projected increases going to almost half of the construction market by 2016. So these are huge changes that we see afoot, and workers in the construction industry need to be better prepared because green work practices will only, only become and more and more quickly become the standard practice. So we can go to the next slide. This, again, is just showcasing the growing industry. It shows the projections, registrations, and certifications uh, over the last eight years or so. And so this is a 2012 graph. But again, it's just showing that um, the registration and certifications are growing and growing. Next graph. Perfect. Um, again, just to highlight some of those statistics. So this is, again, stemming from 2012. Um, you see over 50,000 registered or certified projects internationally, and of that, 4,000 are in Canada. I think the latest statistic is about 6,000 in Canada at this point. Um, 
So that's registered. That's not necessarily certified. Certified is about 1,000. And of that, uh, close to 40% is in Ontario. So quite impressive for our market. And it's just showcasing the fact that the Toronto industry is, is really, really leading the way in terms of construction and in terms of these green builds. The next. And then again, you know, visually, some people like it in graphical form, some people like it on, on the map. So we just wanted to demonstrate the reach and popularity of these lead buildings within Ontario. Um, we have about, you know, over 1,500 buildings that are registered for lead certification, but may or may not have achieved that certification. So if they're registered, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're, they've been certified yet. And we have about 250 or so that are certified. Within that, it's over 200 buildings from Toronto alone. Um, and from that, about 50 of those are certified. And again, just showing with Toronto, um, you know, this shows a, a number of the larger cities across North America, and Toronto is really leading the way. So really interesting for us. This is quite the key market for green building. So lots of opportunity here. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, for uh, for that. There certainly is a lot of uh, lot of activity. It's been amazing uh, um, to see that transformation happen since uh, since 2000 in, in the building sector. Um, before I, I start talking, and I just wanted to go back and, and touch on some of the, those sustainability challenges and draw a bit more of a connection between uh, lead and some of the um, emerging um, systems that are, are being uh, being created. But before I do that, we had a poll that we wanted to uh, to share. So my colleague uh, Tyler is just going to uh, put that up, so you'll see a switch in switch it in screen. But we just wanted to get a sense from folks who are on the uh, webinar what their um, what their skill set is. So if they have if they got lead certification or living building certification. Um, so we'll just take a few minutes or a minute or so to do this. <clears throat> So here are the results Everyone of the poll. The poll okay? okay, I'm not I'm not able to see them at this time, Tyler. So maybe you can. Hide oh, okay. Them. So the um, so we're sharing the poll results. I guess um, possibly John can't see them right now, but we've got 31 percent who have said that they are lead accredited. And everybody else, 69% who voted, are, are neither LEED nor Living Building Challenge accredited. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks for that, Tyler. So it gives us, uh, gives us a sense of, um, of the, on the accreditation side. And we'll, we'll come back to that Living Building Challenge in a sec, because I think this is a nice, it's a neat new evolution um, of the, of the lead, uh, LEED system. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So. Uh, so this was covered a little bit earlier, but I just wanted to come back to this to really hi highlight the, uh, even though we see a lot of new activity, in particular around green buildings, uh, for new buildings that are being built, there's still a number of challenges that we, that we, that we're, and probably a number of us are familiar with from a sustainability perspective. So these, the, these are some of them. Um, when you look at water, uh, from even a municipal perspective in Ontario, there's about $700 million a year uh, that that is uh, being lost, lost revenue, lost or or costs that don't need to be expended um, that are associated with uh, leaky pipes. Also, three percent of that water that we're that we're treating, that we're paying money our tax dollars to actually treat, is is consumed as we drink. The rest is used in other processes. Uh, construction waste, uh, same same thing. Uh, Canada, if you look uh, compare us to the rest of the world, we're we're. Uh, in the worst category in terms of the amount of waste that uh, that we produced, and construction waste itself is still quite significant. 
um, even even so, there are yes, there have been changes in uh, recycling and waste diversion as a result of as a result of lead um, lead practices and better practices within the sector, and also the the um, I guess the the cost savings associated with the recycling materials from demolition. Um, <clears throat> another just another quick uh, point here. Greenhouse gas emissions again they're not even though we've been more uh, efficient in a number of ways our overall greenhouse gas emissions are are still uh, increasing and this is just to show that yes there is there is a difference when you look at uh, community design in the greenhouse gas uh, impacts of that both from the buildings materials and transportation uh, perspective um, a lot of the work that I've done over the years has been with municipal governments, so this this gives us a you know a good sense of of, of how um, well it gives us a little bit of a sense of how municipalities are spending their spending their money, and there's a fair bit that goes into um, into buildings and uh, into energy, um, and as a result, there's there's an impact there. So there there have been a number of changes in the municipal sector that kind of mirror what's happened with the lead, the introduction of LEED uh, in, in into Canada, which happened in late 90s, early early 2000s, um, and the municipality, a number of municipalities have made strong commitments to redo their, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, which comes through both in their building portfolio and, and transportation systems and, and a variety of other activities. Um, so the cost, interestingly here, the cost to municipal governments could could be reduced um, if, they're, if they Continue to reduce their uh, emissions and come up with other other cost saving measures. So there's there's money there's money in there, um, and that's this is what a number of municipal governments have done in terms of creating new buildings and using some of their um, cost savings to to reinvest in other other things like green building retrofits. Um, <clears throat> so. There, there's also a number of of, uh, of other benefits that go along with this, and I'm, I'm just skimming through some of the um, some of the challenges because I know that the audience here is quite is familiar uh, with them based on the survey. The interesting thing here is that there is a difference between the new buildings that are are coming out and the existing building uh, the existing building stock, right? So we have um, you know the majority of buildings and stuff that we've built is there, and that that's where the opportunities. Um, big opportunities are from from an uh, environmental uh, sustainability and, and social perspective is how, what can we do with that existing building stock to uh, to, to bring it up to um, a higher a higher standard if you will um, the the impact of, of user behavior this was touched touched on a little bit earlier and, and this this is one that businesses in particular really like to see is that uh, both you know the the behavior impact from a, a green perspective is, is pretty um, high and if we're not designing our buildings in a way that takes into account human behavior then we're not going to get the same type of efficiency savings. The other, the other side on the, from the behavior side which is not touched on this slide specifically um, but the productivity uh, changes in, in new green buildings has been quite it's been sort of one of those unexpected conse uh, consequences or benefits I should say for green buildings where there's a lot more uh, interesting um, productivity measures in, within the new green buildings. That is, there's there's a higher uh, rate of productivity of employees, both in, from a production perspective and also within uh, within the service sector as well. Um, this is uh, this slide really just looks at uh, again the potential for uh, cost savings um, in the private sector, and there's 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 a significant amount of money that's estimated by uh, McKinsey, McKinsey on some of their reports, um, and again, this really this really requires us to not only look at the types of buildings we're building, but also the behavior within those buildings too. Um, some of the other things that were that were, were touched on a little bit earlier, there there are a whole series of other benefits that that come along with building green um, that relate to you know local jobs, um, different. Different types of relationships that develop from uh, the the within the sectors creating these new buildings. So there's a lot of economic benefits. Uh, the asset, the quality of the assets, uh, water efficiency measures. There's there's some value in there that uh, developers and builders are are being able to realize when they when they decide to turn over their assets or to sell them. And of course the environmental impacts as well, which we've already heard about. Um, also tenants are are looking for you know they're seeking out newer buildings. So that uh, 
that creates an opportunity not only for new builds but also for the retrofit of uh, existing buildings. Occupancy rates. So this is the stuff that you know uh, those who who manage uh, manage large facilities or large portfolios of facilities look at when they can see that the occupancy rates are a little bit higher in in lead buildings uh, as compared to some of the others, and the sale price is also higher. Uh, so th you know these are the numbers, nuts and bolts things that the the, the financiers um, pay very close attention to. So if we look at uh, what's coming? What's coming next? We've had, you know, with the introduction of, of lead into Canada um, you know, again, early 2000s. There's been um, it's been wonderful, and you saw that slide earlier that sort of has showed the number of green buildings that are now in construction versus the more traditional method. So that leads that leads to the question for me, and then the work that we do. Well, is 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 lead enough? Um, is there if all of the buildings in Canada were lead? Uh, platinum would would we have a sustainable building sector? Is is that it? Uh, is that the end goal? And that same question was something that uh, a number of the folks who helped set up the lead uh, system in in the states, and in particular through the Cascadia B Green Building uh, uh, Council, the Green Building Chapter, and this is in uh, Portland, Seattle area. They they were starting to ask themselves that question and said, okay, well, what's what's next? What's after lead platinum? And this is I'm I'm not a representative of uh, Living Building Challenge or um, or or Lead, but having had some experience in the sector over the years, it's something that's just been very uh, very interesting to me to see that emergence. So there is there is now a new um, a new thing called the Living Building Challenge, which is also administered by uh, by uh, Canada Green Building Council in Canada and and also in the U.S. So it's sort of a it was created by them and. The difference between LEED and the Living Building Challenge is that um, LEED does a, a fantastic job at looking at the various uh, changes that can be brought into a new building from a, you know, from a stepwise approach. So it says, you know, here, here are a number of the incremental changes that you can make in your building portfolio, uh, and some of them are very transformative as well. Um, the Living Building Challenge, what it does is it starts at the, at the opposite end. It says, look, if we're going to really build stuff, uh, from a sustainable perspective, um, then what are those characteristics? What are what what are the things that we need to make sure are integrated in into this design um, from a, a wide variety of of perspectives, uh, social, environmental, economic, the, you know, all of the technical aspects of the building, the beauty of the building itself, um, and then also some of the materials that are used. So there are there in, through this challenge there are also um, a, a series of, of materials that are not uh, that are on a, a, a list that are not appropriate to, to put into buildings, and I've personally used this, uh, the Living Building Challenge, to do my own retrofit at home over the last uh, couple of years. And um, as a sustainability professional, uh, it is uh, sometimes it is challenging to get those uh, materials or to, to find uh, to find others. But uh, so what I'm I'm not going to go through the Living Building Challenge uh, content structure details uh, today. Uh, that's that's not the purpose. It's really to say here's something that's emerging. Um, it's similar to LEED. It does look at uh, different uh, typologies, and in, uh, uh, and in this case, there's the renovation side, landscape and infrastructure, buildings themselves, and uh, which is you know similar to the to 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 LEED, and also neighborhoods. So there's Again, there's a lot of similarities to LEED, and this is sort of an emerging way of looking at bu at, uh, at buildings and neighborhoods. So w within that, there are a number of uh, buildings now. Um, I, w I wouldn't say there aren't thousands, <laughs> but perhaps uh, approaching hundreds in Canada, the US, uh, Europe, around, around the world, which are, are shining examples of this, of this um, advanced way of, of building. So there's a few. This is one, it's the Omega Center. For sustainable living down in uh, in New York, this is one of the early ones, which was um, uh, certified back in uh, 2009, um, and it has a number of advanced features. So similar to what you would see in in uh, in uh, lead uh, some of the lead platinum buildings, um, and uh, perhaps more more comprehensive in another number of ways in terms of the materials that's selected, and uh, the, uh, the the functionality of of the site. So what you're seeing over here is most uh, water, um, you know, I think it's, this one is a gray water uh, recycling system that's integrated into the, the design of, of the facility. 
Um, <clears throat> there are, are a number of other buildings that are, are in uh, that are are being pursued uh, or in, for for this living building challenge. Uh, some large scale uh, f facilities, and I believe this one hasn't moved forward. This is the Sustainability Center in, in Oregon. Um, so it's not only small buildings, but there are also a number of uh, new uh, large scale facilities that are being built. So there, and there is a lot more information for those who are interested in sort of what's 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 next, what's after after leads, what what's happening at the cutting edge. There's an excellent website that the Living Building Institute has where where they provide lots of information and and details, both of the rating system. You can download the guide from from the site and also um, examples of, of of current projects. So there's certainly a lot more detail there that I encourage you to look at if that's of interest. One of the other areas, and this, this also relates to both to lean and living building, and if we think of that, about that glass of beer, I know it's only, uh, it's only, it's, it's still early in the day, but it's okay to think about a glass of beer once in a while. The, the glass itself, you know, most of the existing buildings is, 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 is the majority of the beer in the glass and the rest is the, is the head on top. So if we look at things from a neighborhood perspective, you know, we're not going to be able to go in and, and sort of, uh, tear up all the buildings and, and recreate them, if you will, using lead or, or living building. So how this, this guide, this is a new guide I, I had the pleasure of working on, looks at how can we actually engage people in our neighborhood at a neighborhood scale to uh, begin to go through that type of transformation. How can we do it in a, in a stepwise approach, not only from a building perspective, but from a whole variety of other community systems. So this is a new guide we developed out in Alberta, which was informed by a bit the Living Building Challenge and, and the Lead Neighborhood Guides and a number of others that have been created. And it really focuses on how you can have a conversation at a neighborhood scale um, about that transformation that, that needs to take place uh, within our neighborhoods from social, environmental, and economic perspective. So what we had done is we had put, developed the guide looking at all the research stuff, and then we actually wanted to practice, you know, try it out. So we worked with the Ramsey Community Association in, uh, in the city of Calgary to help the Ramsey Community Association develop a sustainability plan for their community, for their neighborhood. So these are you know, a couple of pictures from the engagement process. Um, and what that done, what's that's done is it's allowed the uh, community to create this fairly detailed plan that describes the direction that they'd like to go in, and they're able to use that plan um, in conversations with um, with uh, builder with builders, developers that are coming in. There's a lot of new development that's going to happen, and that new development, uh, the conversations are not only about the green features of the new buildings, the new neighborhood, but it's also how can that new development help the existing neighborhood, the existing uh, community groups um, go through a bit of revitalization as well. Um, this next example I'm going to share looks at um, some of our work with the Natural Step with a group called the Landmark Group of Builders. And they are uh, a building company in Alberta that operates in Edmonton, Red Deer, and Calgary. And they went through a process of um, not only asking, you know, how could they build buildings more efficiently, but how could they, how could they as a company operate in a really sustainable way. So this kind of looks at how we're building or greening the building sector uh, itself. So they, their vision um, through the work that my colleague uh, Sarah, Sarah Brooks has led with them uh, is, is now that they want to be recognized uh, for sustainability and for leading a revolution in the industrialization of housing construction. And the way that they've, um, that they've done that is, is by really empowering uh, staff, working with, with their staff internally to uh, more fully understand what sustainability is, not just from the environmental side, but from a, from a, a social and from an economic perspective as well. And um, that process, it follows what we call the, the framework for strategic sustainable development. So I'm just going to talk briefly about how we use this framework, uh, this common language, and brought it into the organization to help them, um, to, to help them develop a sustainability strategy uh, and approach that was meaningful and relevant to, to, to them as an organization. So this is our, what we call our ABCD process, which it goes, you know, goes through a series of, of steps for them to assess their organization. It's, it's like traditional strategic planning, but it's based on backcasting, where we start off by uh, articulating a, a clear vision of what, is, what, their, what the landmark group of builders would look like if they are operating and functioning within a, a sustainable, completely sustainable manner. 
and it involves and also a baseline assessment and coming up with strategic activities that they could, would put in place to move towards that new description of success. Um, so within this, there are a whole series of things that we worked on, um, my colleagues here have worked on with the organization uh, that involved building that capacity of staff. Um, so it wasn't about outside experts coming in and telling them what they needed to do. Uh, there was certainly some of that, but it was largely about how can we build that uh, competency uh, the sustainability competency within the organization so that they could better understand, appreciate, and then act and, and work on uh, their both their key sustainability challenges and also articulating their, their future um, description of success, if you will. So that was this work was done through a series of um, engagements, workshops, uh, sessions with staff, working with a core team within the organization, uh, their sustainability committee and executive team. Uh, and coming up with, um, with, with a plan with very clear performance measures and uh, recommendations for, uh, for them. So through that process, just to touch on their own identification of challenges, uh, um, I won't read through the list here. We have a, a very detailed case study on our website as well. But this gives you a sense of what they were, what they were uh, having an honest conversation about. So when you look at the, build, their, the way that they were building buildings, as many, as many builders do, um, they are able to identify some very important things that are challenges for them that they need to be able to address if they're going to start building stuff and continue building stuff in a, in a detailed way. At uh, the opposite end, they were able to articulate very clearly what, what success was for them. What are, what are the goals that they're moving towards? So, you know, quite simply, if you're looking at um, operating in a carbon neutral fashion, um, which looks at the net life cycle of greenhouse gas emissions of their products, processes, and they're heading towards having zero or, or negative impact from, from a carbon neutral or, or toxic or waste perspective. These are significant challenges um, and not something that you know, will be accomplished in, in a few years, but rather it's a, uh, a north star or a light that they, um, that they, a measuring stick that they hold themselves up to as they're, as they're moving forward. Um, so what they've done, if we get into some of the results, which I think is, is the really interesting part, is that they, they do have now a net zero home design and they've been working uh, towards being able to offer those net zero homes at market value compared to some of their, some of their competitors. Um, they have reduced their greenhouse gas emissions by about 55% compared to convention, conventional construction. Um, waste production, uh, and this, this time frame for this, this is in over the last um, several years. So it's, uh, it's taken some time to do it, but there's been a fairly, a fairly big impact, as, as, as you can see from this as well. Um, and then they're also focusing, if you look at this port, part down here, is instead of consuming more uh, land, agricultural land from a you know, development perspective, they're, they're, they're trying to find other ways to, um, to, to address that by looking at infill, for example. Um, so a number of their homes now in between 2010 and 2012 are, are Energuide rated. Um, they've, and 60% of the homes in Alberta were, have been built, 80% of, 80 of those were built by uh, Landmark. And their, their buildings also include a whole series of, of uh, green features as, as well. Um, the other neat thing too is that not only in what they build, but also in how they operate as an organization, they've been able to identify a whole series of actions from uh, from members of the of their organization. How can they operate and function differently in use of hybrid vehicles, for example, um, sourcing construction material from from local suppliers as opposed to as opposed to getting stuff from from overseas. So as a result of this, they've that's led them to. Um, to come out of the, I guess, to come out of the closet and to to be recognized as a as one of the emerging leaders in in the uh, in the in the, in the building sector in, in Alberta, and and across the country as well. Um, so these are some of the awards that they've uh, won, and this is the uh, the CEO of um, of uh, of the landmark group of builders, uh, Reza, who was awarded um, the Order of Excellence in, in Alberta in 2010, in part for this work, but also because of his uh, long-standing support and work within the community as well. So I'd encourage you to have a look at what Landmark uh, Group is is doing and some of uh, some of their examples. And uh, again, as I said, there's more uh, details up on the website.
So one final one final example, and then um, then we'll pause, and we've got another poll, and we'll open it up for questions as well. Um, another group that we've had the pleasure of working with, and I, I talked about uh, Interface earlier, so I won't go through their case study, and they're one of the, the first companies in North America that used and adopted the Natural Step framework, and for those in the sector, we've, we've been able to see the, the transformation they've gone through. So similarly, uh, this is another, um, this is an architectural firm out in the west coast of, of the states, Sarah Architects, and in, um, in I think it was about 2002, 2003, we, uh, our office in, in the States worked with the staff to create, help them create their sustainability strategy. So um, they have, um, they've gone through a whole bunch of, of changes. So we followed a similar process of develop that ABCD approach I, I talked about earlier, of developing that awareness and knowledge within staff, which was already quite high, but this sort of re-strengthened uh, it and, um, and help develop um, awareness in, beyond the competencies of, of, of staff at that point. So they designed and, um, uh, buildings uh, all over the place, uh, in particular on, on the West Coast, and they have a number of you know, lead um, buildings and some living cha challenge buildings as, as well in their portfolio. So for them, again, their commitment really begins when, in terms of how they operate and run their business and how they engage staff. Uh, et cetera, and they've, they've been very supportive of other organizations that are, have gone through similar similar processes. So for them, they, again, they, they really wanted to come up with new ways of doing things and, and have exist sort of at, at that uh, cutting edge, and there, there are certainly others in, in the sector who do that as well, but this is the, one of the groups that we've had the pleasure of working with. Um, so this, just to share a few of the a few of the examples, and they've done lots of stuff within their organization. Uh, they have a, you know, I, didn't, I was wanted to put the picture up, but I was trying to save slides. But they have a neat picture of um, a commuting program that they have, where there's a number of people who bike into work, and their cycling is often one of those things that's that's challenging and uncomfortable for people who don't do it. Um, so there's a neat little commuter program with a younger person um, bringing in on on his uh, on his um, tandem bike, uh, uh, one of his colleagues is a little, was a little older and perhaps not as comfortable in cycling. So there's a whole bunch of really neat things they've done just within their office. And then their building products, this is one, this is a new, uh, not a new building, a retrofit that, uh, uh, that exists within uh, Portland. And it was an old tower that was extremely energy uh, inefficient, a um, little dilapidated that, that they've uh, revitalized, if you will, and it's. I, I visited the site uh, about a year and a half ago, and it's just this a beautiful building now. Um, the Sacramento Affordable Housing. So this is this is another. This is a newer uh, building that they uh, that they put together in affordable housing, uh, very very green. I believe this one was the lead uh, platinum building, uh, and had also integrated um, some of the healthcare services. This is one of their first uh, living building challenge uh, facilities that they put together called the Rose House. And um, I, this was on a slide a little bit earlier, the Oregon Sustainability Center also looking at that uh, living building challenge. Um, and I, I believe this one was put uh, on the back burner, if you will. So I was kind of rushing, rushing forward, just recognizing the, uh, the time for those. And there is a lot more information about both of those examples and, and others up on the website. So I'd like to just to pause now, and to um, so open it up to uh, to questions that you might have. And there's also a a poll we'll do. So let's let's take a few questions to start. And, and the way we'll do that is by you're able to sort of type type them in in uh, in your box, and uh, we'll get Tyler's uh, Tyler's excellent coordination help to uh, uh, either put you on the microphone or to read out those questions, and then we'll we'll take turns uh, responding to them as appropriate. Yep, so you can just uh, enter any questions that you have right into that questions box there, and then we'll put you on the line to talk to John directly. Okay, well, maybe maybe while people are thinking of questions, uh, Tyler, let's put up that uh, the polling question that we had, um, and then that might spark some additional uh, questions from folks, too. Sure thing. That sounds good. So the polling question here, um, as, as you'll be able to see in a sec, uh, we're just like to get a sense. We've we've talked about uh, being able to offer more 
uh, workshops or uh, focus content for people within, within the Toronto area. So we wanted to get a sense today of, of what might be of, of interest or, or relevance and uh, we recognizing that this is, you know, an early poll, it might, um, there might be other things that come to mind afterwards as well, but we thought we'd take the opportunity just to, to ask people what, uh, what their interests might be. All right, so we've got uh, a bunch of answers in now. I'll just close the poll and then share the results. So 33% of people are interested in LEAD or want to learn more about LEAD. 48% want to learn more about the framework for strategic sustainable development. 37% would like to learn more about the living building challenge. 52% would like to learn more about amazing neighborhoods. And another 52% would like to learn more about case study examples. Great. Thank you very much for that. So we'll, we'll definitely, um, maybe in the follow-up email uh, to participants, we'll be able to provide some additional information or links to both the Amazing Neighborhoods material um, and L Living Building Challenge and FSSD and, and LEAD. So we'll do a follow-up email after as well to uh, share some of the resources and tools that, um, that, we're, that we're familiar uh, with. And then we'll also uh, talk about that to see what kind of um, sessions we might be able to put together for, um, for this audience and others in, uh, in the new year. So are there any... Any questions that have come up, uh, Tyler? Or? Yes, we've got a bunch of questions here now. Right. So I'm going to put Daniel on the line, Daniel Conter. Daniel, can you hear us? And can we hear you? Oh, Daniel doesn't have a mic handy, so I will read his okay. question for him. Thanks. Could you go over the difference between LEAD and the Living Building Challenge a little bit? So the difference between the two. Okay, so I think, um, and um, then I'll, I'll ask. I'll ask. Do you want to? Do you want to touch on that at all? Or are you comfortable touching on that? Living building college is just a, a little bit more complex in nature in terms of its uh, strategies and kind of stringencies around energy uh, requirements. Lead um, is prescriptive in terms of um, targets. So there are, like I said, a number of different categories and uh, prerequisites and credits that you can achieve through that, um, and it's that 100-point system. But Living Building Challenge kind of teases it out a little bit more. There are a lot more um, requirements and a lot more details around those uh, requirements. And so the, the kind of baseline in terms of... Um, how should I call it, baseline in terms of energy efficiency or, or performance is, is quite a bit different. Yeah. But we can certainly, um, within that email, send you links so you can research it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's just it's two different systems. Yeah, yeah. so the, I guess the one thing I'd, I'd add to that, uh, which, which builds on what you're saying, is that essentially it's raising the bar. So the you know the the bar for lead platinum is very is very high, and the living building challenge raises it even higher. Um, I think the other what makes that bar higher, uh, from my from my perspective, is is the um, is the expectation. Uh, so the the buildings need to cover off a whole a whole diversity of um, of, uh, of 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 factors or attributes at, and at a higher level than uh, than uh, lead uh, than sorry than lead platinum. And the other aspect, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, uh, Dan, as well as the um, there is a, a list of materials that are not, you know, if you if you put them in the building, for example, then that would that would make it more challenging or disqualify you from uh, from being able to get the certification from the Living Building Challenge. Yep, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the intent for that is to say, well, there are certain products that are um, that are yeah that are that are very very difficult to manage, and, or that we that there's no way of, of recycling them uh, them properly. Great. Thank you for that uh, for that question. All right. So the next question is going to come from Andy. So Andy Tran, I'm going to put you on here. Can you hear us? Oh, hi there. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Andy. Thanks very much. Hi there. Thanks very much for uh, the presentation and the information. Um, I'm, I'm in the, uh, the single-family dwelling uh, sector, and uh, sort of the part that interests me are 
uh, really lead for homes as well as leads, lead for neighborhood development. I've been to a couple of um, sections before where uh, it's been indicated that uh, neighborhood development is something that's a little bit slow to, to um, uh, materialize in Canada. And I just want to know if there's anything you know recently or anything that's been going on on that side of things um, you know, in terms of lead for, for neighborhood development. There have been a number of initiatives. Um, one of the ones that is already well on its way is Regent Park in Toronto. So if you wanted to do a little bit of investigation through that, um, there are a, a lot of really interesting features for that neighborhood development. They do geothermal systems and, and such. Um, as far as um, other ones in the mix, there's a lot of discussion about some of the other neighborhoods in the city. but um, I don't think that anything is so far advanced that they're able to really speak to what it looks like as of yet. Um, that's from Toronto angle. I don't know, John, if you have anything across the country that um, some other projects that are underway. Yeah, so yeah, Regent Park is certainly an, an excellent one. Um, some of the other ones, it's, it's been interesting because there, there isn't, you know, with, with, um, within the building, even within the building sector, a lot of the attributes of, of lead buildings have been adopted and integrated by other, by other builders into their practice, but they don't necessarily go through uh, the certification process. And I'd say the same thing for, from the neighborhood side. So there have been some retrofits like uh, Benny Farm in Toronto uh, where they've, they've integrated a number of the uh, design criteria from Lead ND, but I don't believe they've gone through that certification process. Mm -hmm. um, in Victoria, there's uh, Dockside Green, which is one of, one of the it's a really neat uh, uh, neighborhood, uh, new neighborhood that's been designed and has a lot of amazing attributes um, similar to, to the Re Regent Park. Um, and then there are uh, a few in Al Alberta as well. Um, in around Edmonton, there's uh, one called Center in the Park. Um, those are the ones I'm, I'm familiar I'm familiar with, and I think again, th there's a difference between uh, using the guide versus going through the uh, the certification process to make it more official. Um, and that that's been it's something that I you know on the de on the development side, there's um, I'm, I'm not sure of the breadth of experiences, but I know that there's been, there've been some challenges to to Designing neighborhoods in in, um, in in a slightly different way using lead ND, but I, I'm mm -hmm. not an expert in that area, and I don't pretend to know uh, to know more specifically what those uh, what those challenges have been. Okay, great. Um, do you see any opportunities with lead ND, say, for uh, um, existing old neighborhoods and, and retrofitting entire sort of uh, communities? Um, one of the things in Toronto is that there there are many post-war um, communities that are built between you know the late 40s till about 1970. The homes were very well built, so you know there are two, three, three bedroom bungalows um, that uh, were very well built. Unfortunately, they're not very energy efficient because they're solid masonry construction. They're not they're not well insulated, mm -hmm. uh, etc. And uh, you know, I uh, just wanted to know if you if you had any thoughts on um, you know that being a, a good candidate for things like uh, lead ND or lead homes, uh, things like that. Uh, I mean, I'm just speaking from the GTE perspective. I'm sure that's uh, something that is relevant across the board in Canada. So just to, to answer that, I mean, there definitely are discussions around existing buildings. And there are, so what I was um, hinting at before, there is a neighborhood that is under discussion at the moment to transition those existing buildings into something that would hopefully qualify for a neighborhood development project. Um, Again, I'm not sure how much planning has gone into it because I've only heard it um, from a third party. But I would say maybe keep watch um, for something called uh, District 2030 because there is a lot of discussion working with the existing building operators and, and owners in terms of transitioning that over to something that's a little bit more energy efficient. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All, all right, so we've got a question here from John Kozak. And John, I'm going to put you on the line. John, can you hear us? I will ask John's question for him then. Has the Canadian weather posed unique challenges and perhaps unique solutions with regards to meeting code and the standards set by LEED? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, good question. I, I um, 
I know it has up when you go up north and you're you're dealing with you know Arctic conditions, um, and there's a fair bit of flexibility uh, in that. But um, in terms of you know in terms of the other areas across the country, I, I don't think it's been a challenge. Um, you know when you're dealing with things like uh, rainwater harvesting systems, that becomes a little more problematic when you're setting them up here versus down in, in California. There's there there are different systems, but they still function. They still function the same. Just need to make sure that they're set up properly. Uh, I'm not sure, Dan, if you have any other uh, reflections on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that the biggest issue that comes to mind when developing any project is the building envelope, and so you always have to gear that towards, you know, the regional uh, climate. And so I think just in terms of lead, um, working towards getting the right R our values and so forth. It, it's a challenge, especially when you're trying to make something aesthetically pleasing as well. But if you're developing in the area, um, you're already concerned with those issues. So I don't think that it's necessarily specific to the lead rating system, but just in general to, to good solid structures. All right, great, thank you. Um, do we have time for one more here? Uh, yeah, we're at uh, twelve fifty-six, so okay. we're we're okay. I mean, I'm I'm okay to stay a little bit longer if, if others uh, want to as well. Um, but, but again, I just want to respect people's uh, people's time. So we'll we'll um, bring it to a close around one, and then we'll if people want to stay a little bit longer. We're happy to continue uh, responding to questions. Excellent. So the next question is going to come from Marcy Bucking, and I'll put her on right. Yes. Now. Can you hear me? Yes, Marcy, we can hear you. Oh. Perfect, that's yes, boking. Okay, um, that's okay, no, everybody gets that wrong. Um, yeah, my question was uh, surrounding trade. Um, I just finished the program uh, here in Burlington um, on home renovation, and we got we went over very little as far as sustainability is concerned. Um, I think I credit that a lot to uh, maybe just the age of the teachers as well. Um, they were in the industry for anywhere from 20 to 30 years. And um, maybe they weren't as exposed to this kind of stuff. Um, so I felt a little, a little, um, I guess, disappointed and, and frustrated at times with, you know, the amount of waste we were uh, creating just in learning how to do this kind of stuff and learning how to build homes uh, and do renovations as well. Um, and I just wondered how um, integrated um, you guys are into schools and trades programs and that kind of thing. Um, I w I've been in contact with people from uh, Evolve Builders Group and some, some other people in, in sort of green building design, um, trying to put them in contact with coordinators at the school, um, getting them to, you know, come in and do speeches and things like that. And they've kind of hit um, kind of a, a, not a roadblock, I'd say, but um, just some kind of pushback. The coordinators at the school agree that it's needed, um, but I think uh, they, maybe they just don't see the urgency. Or, uh, or the fact that the industry is moving um, because they're, they're kind of in the school and maybe they don't see it as much. So I'm, I'm again, just wondering um, how you guys t um, are approaching that or, or plan to approach that. Um, increasingly going forward, we will be approaching that. And that's okay. something very big that we're working on here at the chapter. So I would welcome you to uh, communicate with me maybe offline to have a sure. bigger around that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just add to that. Um, we do, uh, from a sustainability perspective, not made specifically, we do um, we do offer training. We do have a partnership with a number of academic institutions in Canada and internationally. And it's been my experience that yes, there is a, a lag. In the, the academic. Sorry, I'm getting a bunch of feedback. So if you could uh, maybe just mute uh, the phone. I'm not sure if others are hearing that too, but. There you are. That should be a little better. Okay. Thanks, Tyler. Sorry about that. So yes, I think the academic sector um, is is slow uh, to respond. The same as 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 big governments. Any big ship takes a lot longer to change. But I am seeing it emerge in other countries in Europe where that type of training is 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 built into the program. There are requirements. So Germany's got a great training program, and in Canada, that's a question that you know when you when I for me a litmus test was when I see Mike Holmes starting to talk a lot more about green buildings and the benefits, and how awesome they are, that I know we're we're getting a lot closer to making those types of changes in the academic sector. Yeah, thanks for the question. All right, so next I'll put on Joyce Stubblefield with her question. 
Hello, Joyce. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, sort of in line with the, the question just before, I am actually uh, embarking upon a research um, program that's an international research program on sustainability. Uh, and I'm looking at faith-based organizations, in particular my own. Uh, so I was just curious to see if, if, um, if you guys have found um, faith-based organizations sort of moving in the direction of sustainable buildings, sustainable practices, and the like. And I just wanted to get your, your take on that because I'm interested in, in helping my organization looking at measuring their performance, you know, sustainable practices, and leadership, mm -hmm. and how all that plays a part in sort of moving into that, that transformation. So um, do you see, um, maybe in Canada, that uh, faith-based organizations are interested in sustainable practices, buildings, you know, those types of things? Great, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll provide just a quick response from what I've seen and then we can share it over. So for me, there's two aspects. One is the actual buildings, and I, I certainly have seen some, some activity there from an energy efficiency perspective because a lot of these institutions, the, or the, the physical assets are, are very inefficient. Um, and then I've had the pleasure of working with the um, Halifax Shambhala Center, which is the Buddhist center there on, on their sustainability strategy. And there's also been some neat work in, across the board in the U.S., but in Madison, Wisconsin, with the faith-based faith uh, groups there. I think it was the United Church or uh, I'm not sure. There's a couple of case studies up on our site there. So I... I I'm seeing some of those. Um, some groups uh, certainly do it. And there are some new uh, church buildings that have been created that I believe in state side that have uh, leads, have used leads um, as well. So those, that's, those are a couple of examples for me. Okay, great. I'll, I'll definitely like to look at your website and uh, maybe also give you a call also. Yeah, please feel free to uh, send me an email and we'll make sure our contact information is, is there in our follow-up communication. Okay, so again, just, just recognizing and respecting people's time, we're, we're just after, sh shortly after 1, one o'clock, so um, I think we're both, uh, I would, Dana, I won't speak with you, but if, you're, if you still have a bit of time, I'm happy to stay on and answer some more questions as well. Sure. All right, so we've got uh, another question here from Dan Wilson, if Dan is still online, yep. Dan, can, can you hear us? So we can't hear Dan, but um, Dan says that the uh, living building challenge seems more performance-based and and leading than lead, which seems more prescriptive and incremental. Is this is this cor a correct understanding? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Dan, for the question. And I think this is, it might be Dan uh, Dan Wilson from up in uh, Whistler. So if it is, hello, and if it's not. Um, Sorry for making the confusion, but yes, that, that's my understanding as well, is that it is more, a little bit more performance-based, mm -hmm. uh, and there are, um, there are you know, certain uh, thresholds that you need to meet. If you don't meet them, then you, you don't meet the challenge, and this is why it is, um, you know, when, when, it, when the program was first uh, evolving, I, I, I jokingly called it uh, lead unobtainium, uh, because, it, because, of its, as, uh, because it was a very, very high bar and the minimum requirements were quite quite high. And what I've been very you know pleasantly surprised to see is that there are a number of, of these living buildings that are uh, right now in Canada in the process of being built or have have been built. There's one in um, I think it's in um, Kelowna, for example, a new library uh, center there that's using uh, that has used and gone through through certification with the living building challenge. Um, yes, but certainly more performance based from my from my perspective. Yeah, and just to kind of add to that as well, I mean, LEAD is looking, because we have these various categories and you're hitting these, these targets, so to speak, on these specific items, it is prescriptive in that way. If you think about what Living Building Challenge is standing for, just from the title itself, it's looking at the whole building system. It's looking at the science and kind of the integrations of, of the whole building um, mechanisms, right? So it, it definitely is more performance on the whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, that's a great point because it, you're right. It's not only the um, you know materials that go into it. All it also is you know beauty is one of the criteria, right? You have to make 
you can't just make an ugly box that's super green and energy efficient. You have it has beauty has to be a strong aspect of of the design as well, right. um, and the integration. You know, one of the things that I found quite interesting personally as a, as a homeowner is that um, if you look at the um, at the at what's called the FAR, right? So there's a bunch of um, criteria. If you have a single family dwelling on a piece of land in a city, then 80% of that land on your lot should be used to produce food. Whereas if you have a you know a much more dense um, building, then then you don't have to use as much space for for local food production. So it's not only the building system itself. There's also some of the social criteria and and other attributes such as as food as food production. Sure. So it, from that perspective, it, it does go it, it goes further in a number of categories than than the um, than the lead rating system does, which makes it a challenge. Um, and that takes in the reason for is that 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 takes into account again from my perspective that if you look at something like an ecological footprint as a tool, which measures our consumption of everything, our food, water, uh, materials, and products, our, our ecological footprint in, in Canada compared to a number of other countries around the world is huge. So in order to get that footprint down in size, there are, there are a number of um, changes and, and, and trade-offs that, uh, that we need to, need to make. And the, the Living Building Challenge really um, eloquently integrates those into its, uh, into its system. So yeah, thanks for the, that question, Dan. All right, so next I'll put on Sahar Youssef. Sahar, are you online? Okay, well, Sahar asks, are there any coming or existing sustainably, sustainability neighborhood projects in the Kitchener-Waterloo area that you would know about? Nothing, nothing that I'm aware of. Yeah, not offhand, but we can certainly do a little bit of research for you. Yeah, I, I think the other interesting thing with the neighborhoods is that a big, a big part of it, again, going back to that glass of beer, is that the, the existing neighborhoods is where, is where there's an opportunity for, for conversation and for transformation as well. And that's, uh, there, there's something in that that's quite, quite interesting yeah, for me as well. And there are some good guides, including the content in the Living Building Challenge in their neighborhood um, a portion and, and lead for neighborhoods that has good information. And then there's other resources like the Amazing Neighborhood Guide, which is really about how, how can you have a, a conversation with neighbors about the neighborhood's future, what they want to have happen, and, and how they might be able to, you know, continue to, to change the things that are, are uh, happening in, in their neighborhood. So lo lots of good resources on that side too. All right, we've got one last okay, Todd, question. So let's, we'll oh. take a, let's take a few. Uh, we've got just one more question here from Fadi. So Fadi Yusri, are you on the line? Yeah. Um, search. Okay. I don't think uh, I don't think he's at. He knows that he's on the line. I think you're right, John. That is? So yeah, I'm back. Uh, so once certified from LEED or the Living uh, Living Building Challenge, uh, what sort of assistance is there um, to get into the field, like uh, for a career in green building and sustainability? You're talking about specifically from the Living Building Challenge perspective, or are you talking about in general? Um, it seems like in general, once somebody has these accreditations. Well, I mean, as part of it, um, in order to get your designation as an advanced professional, so AP, you would need to be working on a project. So it's almost, you know, think of it as a mentorship or a co-op. So. It, it, initially, even with that, you're getting exposure and you're, you're getting connections with people in the industry. Um, and, and beyond that, I mean, even CAGBC, as, a, as our mission statement, we're looking to not only educate and have people accredited, but we're also looking to provide those networking opportunities. So there are conferences, there are um, various events, and people can connect that way. Um, I, I'm not sure what else to, to say beyond that. Yeah. So from from our from our perspective of the natural step, it's it's not something that that we do explicitly. Uh, however, I would say that the the lead certification process is certainly an asset in your toolbox going into the workforce or making changes in the workforce because it's something that 
uh, more and more um, uh, builders, uh, architects, depending on what role you're playing, it's more it's something that people are looking for. Um, so having having that in your back pocket, I think, will, will certainly serve uh, serve you well in your career uh, path moving forward. Excellent, thank you. So hopefully, Friday. Okay, so heard I think that. that was. Yeah. So thanks, Tyler. I think that was the that was the last uh, last question. Then, so um, we will send out just a follow up email and uh, a copy of uh, a copy of the um, slides in PDF form for uh, people and. If you do have questions, then uh, please feel welcome to follow up uh, with either of us moving forward. Any final words, uh, Dana? Um, no, I think that's pretty much it. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, very much. And um, have a wonderful day. And I look forward to speaking with you guys in the future. Thank you. Bye for now.